So, as already mentioned, I have uh, chosen an overall title. Lowering the environmental impact of bridges and wind turbines by improving structural engineering practices. So, this is the day of the final account or final accounts of this research program. There should be something useful coming out of it, not just a high number of papers. Of course, we have to deliver that, that's for sure. But we have to be much better than this. We have. We have to produce a new knowledge that is applied in daily practice of structural engineering in order to achieve these environmental uh, uh, objectives, as well as in order to reduce cost. Infrastructure is too expensive. That's already one statement from me that I will certainly repeat three, two or three times. So, first of all, I would like to present uh, the participants very quickly. And uh, I would like to thank them already that they are available to uh, lead this discussion. <coughs> so, we have uh, Ernst Niederleitinger. That's the next slide, actually. Yes, it's like a list of players of a soccer team. So, we have the researchers, which is one uh, team, and then we have the uh, uh, representatives of the Infrastar Advisory Board, stakeholders, experts, uh, practitioners, they do everything. And we on the Infrastar Work Package leader side, we are not just researchers, we are also consulting engineers, so uh, the opinions might uh, flow around. Uh, yeah, we will see. So we have Ernst Niederleitinger from uh, BAM uh, Berlin, he is head of the non-destructive uh, testing uh, Methods group, a very powerful group worldwide in this domain. Work package leader uh, one. Then uh, also John Sorensen from uh, Aalborg University, work package leader three. He specialized in uh, probabilistic methods in particular, applied to structures, including bridges and in particular also wind turbines. On the uh, Infrastar Advisory Board side, as stakeholders, we have uh, Morten Andersen, is sitting there, from DNVGL, which is a global quality assurance and risk management company. He's a specialist in uh, wind energy, wind turbines, and giving the viewpoint of practice of industry in this domain. We have uh, Mark Thiele from uh, again from uh, BAM Berlin. BAM is standing for Bundesamt für Materialprüfung. He is a, a specialist also in fatigue of concrete, but of course also knowing uh, what happens in practice through uh, expertise work and so on. And last but not least, uh, Tom Frauenwelder from TNO, which is which stands for the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific uh, Research. Is that right? But you are much more known in the literature also as being uh, one of the specialists of uh, probabilistic approaches, uh, structural safety uh, formats, and what we can find in uh, current uh, European standards is very much based on the work of uh, Tom. So, I think we have a uh, interesting team here and I would like to ask uh, the panelists one after the other just to give uh, one statement the work package leaders they should give uh, maybe a summary in, in one quick word what is the outcome of the work package and then the, the researchers also what do they get as a, let's say main impression and main result main keyword out of this infrastructure program. We are actually <coughs> collaborating uh, together for uh, almost four years or roughly four years. So we know each other. And now today is the day of the final accounts. <laughs> I may begin for work package two. And I've select selected the keyword getting more out of bridges and wind turbines. That's the outcome of uh, the four doctoral theses involved in work package two. We developed by means of uh, monitoring uh, 
methods on reef structures. We advanced knowledge in this domain, both on the reef side and the reef turbine side. Monitoring, on-site monitoring, <coughs> and then also uh, by enhancing structural analysis models. Okay, what is the outcome, the main outcome of World Package 1, Council? Thank you and good morning from my side. Uh, the main outcome are tools, uh, tools which are not exactly uh, made to show that our bridges are bad. They are working very nicely, especially in one of the projects, to show that many of our bridges, which are thought to be defunct, are actually okay and can be used much longer than expected. What's the uh, effect on the environment for uh, impact? So, if you don't have to, so replacing a bridge costs a lot of uh, impact on the environment, a lot of carbon dioxide emissions. Concrete, in terms of uh, carbon dioxide emissions, is a very bad material, very nasty material. And if you can keep structures in place for a longer time, it saves a lot of uh, so climate effect, but also in terms of traffic, noise, other kind of things. It really helps. The environment. So this is what I should have added for our package two. Getting more out of existing uh, structures and existing bridges and wind turbines means that we can use them for longer. Mm -hmm. It has a very uh, direct and very clear and obvious uh, impact on lowering the environmental uh, impact. And also we get more out of the money that was invested into uh, this infrastructure. Now, we're package uh, three, John. What is uh, the main outcome, please? Yeah, so that does it lower environmental impact? <laughs> I think so, because uh, what we have been working on is, in fact, the same as we have just heard, but uh, using, uh, in a better way, probabilistic methods to take into account the knowledge we have about uh, the structures, all the data available, and use that to at least go a step to make probabilistic design of of uh, wind turbines and bridges, maybe in different speeds, but going in that direction and making uh, more rational decisions, taking into account reliability and, and risk-based uh, tools. And that's what have been considered in a number of case studies. So that will contribute, I think, also a lot to lowering the levelized cost of energy, which is something which is really important for, for wind turbines. <coughs> So you could say it's a step to a second generation of design tools, especially for uh, wind turbines. But we can discuss how it's possible to apply it also for bridges. We certainly will. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, John. And the stakeholders, by what word, uh, what outcomes, by what findings were you really impressed during the four years? Yeah. Uh, Morten? Yeah, I'm, 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 I must admit I haven't read everything uh, far from, so so I don't know exactly. I was hoping that you would tell me what you today what you found, but I think it's 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 very interesting with the um, with the NDT part too, and that's what I'm looking very much forward to hear what how uh, much can you um, because I think what is relevant for wind turbine for concrete there is e either to and maybe both to be able to monitor the uh, damage, the uh, fatigue damage that happens in the structure somehow by casting something in or by going there and measure. And also, so, so uh, both measuring it uh, as it goes along or maybe go and assess it, what is the damage. So if, uh, I think there is something pointing there and I think it's like John said, it's the, maybe also the first step for that because it's both an understanding of the, um, the NDT methods and also the work package too. How is the material actually acting under uh, cyclic loading? So, so I think that is is something that is really useful both for for lifetime extension of wind turbines, but also for new designs because we can get a lot of learning uh, on the actual fatigue properties. Okay. So yeah. Thank you, Morten. Now, Mark. Yeah, it's uh, for me similar, like Morten has said. Um, yeah monitoring techniques, uh, using new techniques like the coda wave interferometry and also yeah, to co combine different techniques because I think it will be not give one technique that covers all issues we are interested in and we will need a combination of individual techniques. They have uh, their individual advantages 
and to use them here in this project uh, on yeah liberal tests but also on yeah real structures i think it's a big value of this project and for me really interesting to see that okay now tom thank you yeah. uh, if you ask me what i uh, was most impressed that is uh, let's say the, the very large degree of enthusiasm uh, of the people working and the people, uh, let's say, who have been uh, the, the leaders and, and the supervisors. Uh, and I think that on uh, on the individual level, uh, for several projects, very high results have been obtained. Uh, yeah, my enthusiasm is a little bit less if it comes to the integration of the whole, what was one of the purposes, of course, also of this uh, of this project. It is it's still difficult to bring uh, 12 uh, projects in individual uh, universities to a, to a real uh, combined result. And I think that's still one of the things that may be done in the, in, in the next stage. And I think there is potential for that because on the individual level, there is, uh, there is there has been a lot achieved. Okay, thank you, Tom. <coughs> so this brings us, uh, let's say, really to this uh, statement that I designed for this uh, panel discussion. So uh, I think but this can be questioned. I think that structural engineering practices, uh, current ones, they need to be improved in order to achieve this uh, goal of reducing the environmental impact of the built infrastructure. We have to reduce consumption of uh, building materials. We have to reduce energy as well as carbon dioxide emissions. And we have also to reduce the cost. So we have to deal with uh, sustainability. And to achieve all these goals, uh, civil engineers are probably the most important uh, domain or uh, persons to achieve the uh, overall environmental goals of, uh, of EU. We can talk about them. But I, and, and then I think that civil engineers are not really aware of them. Still not aware. Too conservative too much concentrated on their little calculations rather than having some vision. So we should better benefit from research findings. And I think uh, Tom just mentioned the problem we have. We do nice research, but then the step to uh, implement it in engineering practice is a very difficult one. And this has to do with the second point. We have standards and regulative conditions that are so uh, frozen and so rigid that it is impossible with these standards and regulations, that's my uh, statement, to achieve this goal of lowering the environment, environmental impact. For me, the second point is really decisive. We have to change the whole regulation radically. <coughs> Because the third point, we have to uh, provide incentives. We have to motivate people. And the current situation in structural engineering is not at all like this. Engineers are not motivated to apply new technology because it's not possible because regulations are too much frozen. Minus 50 degrees. Cannot change. It's static. In our statements, let's discuss about it. <laughs> and the last one, keep in mind that engineering of built infrastructure is about preserving and optimizing of resources. That was actually the reason why I have chosen this uh, profession already back in the 1970s. For me, it was obvious that we have to go this way. Now it is obvious for everybody. Um, my first question, yes, as they are moving, <laughs> keeping up in book. So, do we really need a need to improve our engineering practices? Who wants to begin? Uh, you, you talked about the, uh, the frozen uh, uh, standards, uh, but the standards are not frozen. Uh, it is uh, uh, the way they are used and implemented in countries and, and used by engineers. If you look into a number of codes, you can find that risk-based approach or probability-based approach are possible. But one thing is then that the country should allow it, and there the authorities are often 
the people who froze. The engineers are not the people who are too enthusiastic. That's all true. But in principle, the code allows. What the code does not always do is giving sufficient guidance in, uh, in thinking terms of what exactly uh, am I designing, what will be the consequences in, in, in several ways. So uh, uh, let's say that, that, that the standard should be, should be changed, but that it is not always the standard itself that is giving the problem, but the way they are uh, treated and the way they are, uh, uh, have, have the, let's say, the place in the, in the, in the legal system of, of some countries. Okay, for the ratification, but still, when you look at, at the way how probabilistic methods are used in practice, I think we should be much better today. Uh, I remember times 30 years ago when, when these methods were introduced uh, and the potential was, was very clear, but what the situation today is now is disappointing. Do you agree with that? Uh, that I agree, yes. Okay. The reason is not the what can we do in order to um, enhance to, to the, the application of probabilistic methods by engineering practice? Maybe John? So we are considering here two different types of structures, namely bridges and wind turbines. And I think the situation is quite different. So what we have heard now is maybe what's the situation for bridges and buildings in general. But for wind turbines, I think it's uh, quite different because there is much more focus on cost of energy and on s maybe not directly sustainability, but at least that's, of course, the main goal because it's renewable energy. And there, there is a big uh, enthusiasm in industry to use probabilistic design. So I have, in fact, given uh, a number of courses on how to use probabilistic methods for industry. And there is a new standard now <coughs> being proposed to be made which is directly uh, connected to using probabilistic design of wind turbines. So there, I think industry is much more uh, aware about the possibilities. But of course, there are also big differences because for bridges, there is a safety issue with uh, human safety, which can be important, which is not in the same way for, for wind turbines. So, yes, so when you say industry, it's the wind turbine industry. So they are far ahead of, of uh, let's say. I would say they so, are more aware. So you are lucky and a good <laughs> position. But then you should help us in the in the bridge domain. How would you do that? What advice can you give us? I think one, and that's also something Tony is very much involved in, is to have a, a better basis for doing probabilistic design. So to have some uh, models on the uncertainties which can be used as basis and which are linked to the way that the traditional uh, design is done by safety factors mm -hmm. so that you can compare with what we are doing now and how can we improve by modeling the uncertainties in a better way and obtain the reliability level we are aiming at. And that work is in fact ongoing, lead it by Ton in relation to the Eurocode revision okay, that's yeah, ongoing now. So there is, there is some step in that direction. That's very positive, it's very good. There is also the Joint Committee of Structural Safety with very good documents and strong. Yeah. They are already 20 years old, these documents, but still not applying in the bridge domain, I must say. Yeah. Now, I would like to have a, a viewpoint from more from the bridge side, maybe Mark. Uh, I'm not really um, <laughs> part from the bridge side because I'm yeah also more focused on wind turbines, but yeah, I totally agree. It's different to bridges because wind turbines are, um, is a kind of standard product. Uh, wind offshore wind farm has probably 80 uh, structures or 80 turbines. So yeah, the benefit is much bigger if you are and have a more economic design or a better uh, monitoring system that ensures you that all structures will work through the whole lifetime. Um, but probably this is a yeah field uh, where the bridge structures can learn from or participate that in this field, yeah, methods or, or standards will be developed, which could help uh, also to use it for, yeah, bridge structures. And for bridge structures, I think, yeah, most of them are really individual structures and they have a longer lifetime than a wind turbine structure, a much longer lifetime. So it's, yeah, I think it's easier for the engineer to use a little bit more material to be sure that it stays for the predicted lifetime and not to yeah save some material to be a little bit more economic so yeah that's a challenge to solve that difference 
So we heard that um, <coughs> this infrastructure research really contributes to uh, extending the lifetime of uh, structures. And uh, you just mentioned the word lifetime. Um, I think we all agree that we can and should extend the lifetime, even for wind turbines. But are there really incentives to do that? Yeah, I, I think it's it, it's interesting with lifetime extensions uh, of, uh, of wind turbines also. And of course, here fatigue comes in and we have to look at what was the design uh, 20 years ago with at that time with the normal time frame for, for wind turbine design. The problem has is with wind turbines that they are they are not uh, only concrete. They have a lot of moving parts. They have blades that are made of glass fiber. Everything wears down. And that, on top of the enormous development that has been in sizes, usually means that when it comes to 20 years, it's not worth keeping it running with the maintenance cost. It's, it's much cheaper to take them down, everything is worn out, and then put up a new one that is much more efficient. Um, so that's what's happening. But there will be some sizes, like a, a car. You, you can, in, in Denmark, you can get a loan for a car for seven years, because that's kind of, that should be the life of, many people drive it for 10 or 15. Um, so, so if you have that, if you're lucky to have a wind farm, that it's worse to keep going. And I think that becomes also more and more relevant now, for, because if you go 20 years back, you were actually building two megawatt turbines, uh, where you now are on, on maybe closing uh, to 10, but it's still big turbines. And onshore, it's maybe not, you are not allowed anyways to put the big turbines up because they are so, so high. So those can be relevant, but it has not been that relevant up to now because the turbines are worn out and it's not worth maintaining them because of the turbine part. But I think it'll become more and more relevant uh, because the, 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 even though the size is still growing, it, it was big uh, 20 years ago also. They were big, especially for onshore. So. Okay, that's an interesting point. When I look into my little country, people are against wind turbines. So the ones that are built, uh, we have to keep them as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it, it, will not, it will not be possible to upgrade them with uh, taller and towers and so on. And this might be an issue also for other parts in the world. Isn't it? So then uh, the our methods that we developed in, in with this research program, they are really relevant in order to extend the lifetime, uh, in particular of the primary structure, the foundation, and the tower of, of uh, wind turbines. Okay, would you agree on that? I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I was hoping that that also Switzerland would go in more into renewables <laughs> than <laughs> wind turbines. Yeah. Sorry for the team. Uh, now we have so, a very densely. Uh, uh, occupied uh, country, the yeah. countryside is okay. maybe, political, unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe if we have to correct the statement a little bit, people are not against wind energy, they are against wind energy next door. Next door. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. So, of course, and that's the same issue in, in uh, Germany. So, I would fully agree that keeping these wind turbines alive, uh, alive at least the foundation and tower structure, would be of great benefit. Just maybe replacing the blades and uh, also the, the generator in these parts. So that would help a lot, just doing repair and maintenance. But, but, but it will still be difficult to find a turbine, like a new turbine that's small. Yeah. It, it, it's <laughs> so that's the challenge, I think, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, and, uh, that there's a big development in the size. So. Okay. Now let's move to, to bridges. So the wind turbines seem to be, uh, yes, the super guys. And the bridge persons, uh, the bridge engineers kind of uh, lay, laying back. So how can we update them? How can we uh, push them forward? Which is actually my daily work. Well, if, yes, the, if the legislation is a blocking factor, yeah. so then we need not to ask for a new legislation, but we need to prepare it. And the legislation should be as simple as possible and should be supported by a set of existing and future European standards. It must not happen in other fields. So, performance standards supporting uh, the legislation, the, the legislation 
should be written both by people like you and similar and by a member of the European Parliament in order to have the proper wording. And then you have to the last step of uh, making it approved, whether it is a directive or it is a regulation. Okay, I must disappoint you. <laughs> I'm really not contributing to uh, code writing anymore. I did that in my little country. I'm afraid of very lengthy and complex uh, processes within the European code, uh, <coughs> editing uh, commissions and committees and groups and whatever. It's very heavy. Mm -hmm. So I have a very pragmatic approach. I say nothing changes. It's all a matter of interpretation of uh, what is standing in the code. Nobody knows it really precisely. So as a structural engineer, I always find a way how to uh, interpret some, uh, let's say, nasty <coughs> article in, in, in the code. And then I uh, adapt it or I reinterpret it for my specific application. I always find solutions like this. Okay? I know. So of course, I need to explain that to uh, other people. So then it is no more a blocking factor, so you have found a way to yes, but, uh, apply the, the current legislation. Maybe I can do that with my little uh, hat on it, but not an average engineer in the engineering firm, not the big max. That's the problem. May yes, get please. I would like to ask you, you also uh, going in that direction, I would expect from your project to make policy briefings out of your research. That is, recommendations on what things should change, either at European or country level, to take them into account. And for example, for me, this would be your, should be your next uh, RISE project, in the sense that you start the collaboration on how you can apply, find what has to be changed in the countries or at the European level. Oh, I understand what you say about the, the, the procedures, which are length and, um, and difficult to, cha to, to, change. to change or whatever, but uh, uh, I think that we should do that because the thing is that now I also at the European level, we are ready to go to do something else. And uh, okay, one way would be that we uh, uh, train and educate all the engineers at the European level, which I think it's not really feasible. All the other ways that it comes as a directive from above, so that everybody needs to do that. Maybe it could be also at the national level that you go to the authorities where the, they implement the, the uh, building uh, um, directives or whatever, and which again going to all little countries is uh, it's not uh, really again uh, efficient. But I, I would expect from your project to have policy uh, briefings from, from your work that can be brought up to either European Parliament or the Commission on things that uh, should change. And it should fit on one page. No, okay. <laughs> no, it could no be. I'm serious. Yes, Just yes, one yes, page. Yes, because yes, you don't, have, you don't have the time to, to Yes, to policy briefings are okay. very short. Mm, policy very briefings short. are very short. And, but we need to find we where to send tonight. them. This, <laughs> you know, the most difficult thing is to give them to, to, to the right person. This is the most difficult. Yes. Another approach is actually that is, has been applied in several of, of the, the PhD uh, projects, showing it by the example. Mm -hmm. We did monitoring on, on real structures. When you look on, on some of the photos, you see a mural viaduct, which is an important viaduct in Europe, and other structures. And, and there are several examples uh, of, of real work demonstrating, really demonstrating how new methods can be implemented in, in practice. So industry only needs to read these, these papers. They are maybe too complicated for them and can be simplified, yes, okay. But only we need to read these papers in order to, to adjust, uh, let's say, uh, or adapt a modern way of <coughs> Most times they need the motive to change and motivation. That is maybe. Oh, that, that must yeah. be money. Yeah. That's uh, okay. Nothing yeah. else. Yeah, money, money, money and time. Uh, money and time. Yeah. You want to add something? Yeah, so. First, I want to agree with you. The standards are not that bad. They allow a lot of things if you look into details. And um, not 
that pessimistic about not not uh, that the standards are to slowly developing. One example would be the model code of the Fédération Internationale de Beton, which is used in many countries as a, at least as a background document for designing, but also for maintaining and for life cycle assessment of structures. And there will be a new version drafted this year. And this will contain a lot of more information about monitoring, testing, and how to integrate this into assessment and uh, how to use it to yeah, keep structures alive. So what is good about that particular standard that it doesn't recommend a particular monitoring or NDT technology. It's just describing the process. Uh, and so it, you don't have to update the standard every year because new techniques are on the market. It doesn't block new techniques. And that's a particular thing I like about it because we have seen in the last 20 years a lot of emerging technologies. 20 years ago, nobody talked about fiber optic monitoring. And one other thing I want to emphasize is the need of uh, demonstration. So that was, uh, Ojen already mentioned that. So we need demonstration projects which don't just show that the particular sensor shows nice curves on the screen, which is done in a many research project. It has to show that it actually the owner benefits by using these technologies combined with other sensing techniques, combined with the probabilistic assessment and so on. And then showing at the end, okay, I've saved that much time, that much money, that much carbon dioxide, whatever. So, and that, that's actually one thing which cannot be fully achieved in a 3.5 years project. And that's why in the end, so it a little bit looks like that these results are not well merged together. So because these demonstration projects on actual bridges, they need a lot of time starting from talking to the owners, authorization, and uh, mounting the sensors. So uh, we have done some. So I'm very happy to hear, for example, that uh, Antoine, one of our, the ESRs, is now working in a company. He's one of the guys with already with the proper head and the industry job. He's applying his knowledge in an actual company, in actual uh, bridge sites. So that's, uh, and I hope he will report on that in conferences in the future and show, okay, that was, uh, was coming out of... Uh, our project. Yes, we have to encourage our ESRs. You are the future. Yeah. Okay, it's up to you. And uh, the concepts are clear where to go. Um, Ernst, you mentioned a very important point. Um, maybe we should, more on the research side, improve our ways how to show what can be the benefit out of our researches. NDT methods, probabilistic methods, it's not so obvious for industry to, to see that. Do you agree? Look at that. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is maybe nothing new. No, it's nothing new. And, and and the the problem, of course, is that uh, we should not think that uh, you can achieve uh, advanced results by simple methods. Huh? Uh, if, if you really want to uh, to say to a stru if, let's say in the past when, when there was a structure and it was a little bit deteriorated, people simply said, let's build a new one. Huh? That was the easy solution, huh? simple. And now we say, can we elongate the, the life of that structure? But for that, yeah, we need we need some more advanced methods, both in the uh, in what is the status of the structure, what is its condition, and, and how will it uh, develop in the future. And uh, so I think that at least a part of our engineers need also a higher education. Huh? Not only the new ones eh, coming in now, but also let's say the people who are now 30 or 40 years old. And also we, I think we have to do some education in, in, in telling them what new methods uh, can uh, have, have for significance for, for how we treat our structures. I think there is a need for that. Thank you very much. So this uh, allows me to make a point. We also have to radically change the education of civil engineers. They are still educated like 50 years ago to build new structures. They have no education in most universities how to deal with existing structures. And what happened? What do we have in Europe? We have a lot of existing structures. Our infrastructure is well developed. Of course, there's still a need for new structures, wind, new wind turbines in particular. But not so many new bridges than 50 years ago. We have to do a better job with the existing ones. Accept them, not just throw them away and build a new one. That's very expensive and invasive in terms of environmental impact. And for this, we really need to change the education. I'm a university professor. 
no one can talk about. Yeah. Yes. And you mentioned also a methodology uh, point. So you have A there, A push A, where industry is looking to the results of research in order to get improvements, or you have A push B, where industry would mention uh, what they are needed in terms of need for improvements, and then for researchers to see how they can contribute. Okay, this brings me to the point and question, why does the civil engineering industry not invest more into research and development? When we compare with, with the industries <coughs> in mechanical in engineering or in, in informatics, of course, and microtechnics and so on, they have a significant investment in research and development within the industry, also uh, the wind turbine industry, but not at all in the bridge engineering. Mm. I would like to discuss this topic. Who wants to raise a point here from the panel? I, I Morten? <laughs> I, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, this is just an idea. I have a feeling from from um, from my work. And the, the uh, I worked with the British for the first five years of my career. And um, I think compared to the mechanical, I, I see that, that the British are usually designed by a consultant who are not owning the product at the end. Mechanicals are often companies that both do the engineering and the product they sell. I think maybe for for a, for a designer, uh, they they do they do definitely do not have money to investigate or invest in the uh, in the um, research and the so owner. Incentive. Yeah, uh, and the, the yeah, exactly <coughs> it's missing. The the owner they do not know what knowledge is missing in order to make it cheaper. I think maybe that link could be a reason for difference in mechanical and civil, but it's just uh, Okay, why is no research in the industry about bridges? There's no research in my country for food. No industry, industrial research. I mean, the sector is not so competitive. Why do you have research in other domains? Because there is a competition, you see? There is a lack of mm -hmm. competition. So how can we enhance this uh, competition? Let's yeah. yeah, you have to demonstrate uh, the success uh, that is possible by doing this research. You have to show the opportunities, and maybe like the best key is always to to show how this even uh, saves money or how this profits you in a political way uh, by maybe saying our company is uh, the green uh, green bridge supplier or something. So again, demonstrating what are the benefits, huh? The issue that you already had, everybody agrees. For my, my keyword, application is the best peer review of research. <laughs> we should go a higher level, to go to a higher level, and not just asking the ESRs to, to produce some peer reviewed journal papers. That's daily life, daily business, everybody can do that. We have to go a step higher and also require now uh, for future uh, programs like uh, Infrastar, require some some uh, implication uh, implementation on, on real projects and, and uh, making this as, as a project objective. It's not so easy to do that. I know that, <laughs> but maybe this this should be uh, an objective to be discussed. At least yes, <laughs> maybe Mark Mark was first. Yes, I think yes, that's one of the big challenge for the research. And yeah, as Ernst mentioned before, such a research project has usually three, four or five years time. And if you like to uh, develop a new advanced method, you need this time only focus on this method. And the second part, but would be yeah to apply that on a real structure and also to yeah, provide your new information or your method in a way uh, that the engineer can understand and, and see that there is a benefit for them. So yeah, I think there is a need for a second part or step of a project or such a development yeah, to yeah, provide this information in a way um, that the engineer can use it and yeah, to um, see or um, yeah, do it on real structures and make yeah, some projects and show that it works on real structures that yeah, makes the engineer uh, give him the yeah knowledge and also to make them sure that they can use it in real structures and it will give some benefit and 
to, to keep them with these new methods and new techniques. Demonstrate that we yes. can do it. I think that's a, a Then key. we can say, just do it, yeah. go for it. <laughs> okay, then there was a call yeah. who wanted I think that's also an, uh, an important role for, uh, for, for governmental organizations, for the authorities, to come up with certain requirements. Uh, we're not talking about bridges, but other big civil, civil engineering structures we have in the Netherlands, uh, a lot of them, of course, dikes and, and, uh, and tunnels and, and more of those things. And there, the, the government has been more performance-based designed, less prescriptive, and even have sometimes their requirements in, in probabilistic uh, terms. And there you see that industry really picks it up because the requirement is from the other side. And I think that's the difference with bridges where the th authorities are a little bit reluctant to put their performance requirements in, in, uh, in, in those terms. So we also need very good people uh, working for the, the authorities. It's very much so. It's underestimated largely everywhere. It's very important in order to, uh, yeah, this is the key word, incentives, how to make people uh, move. But what uh, needs also to be done is a higher role for the European uh, Trade Association of Trade Federations. So all the European federations need to play a higher role, including a higher political role. So if you have good contacts with uh, this federation, most of them are here in Brussels. So like we recommend that you take the necessary time. Yeah. In order to convince the Secretary General and the staff and uh, the Board of Administration so that they will take uh, the proper actions with enough political will in order to influence uh, not just the Commission but also the national authorities. Yes, but don't you think that this is a, a game more on a very um, high level with this must, general keywords this everybody must, agrees on? This must also happen. This must also happen. Yeah. yeah. Very good comment. Yes. So, so just nice. yesterday there was just yesterday there was a deadline for European proposals uh, for a CSA uh, coordinated support action. I think is the right word, uh, which should set the basis for bridge assessment, better monitoring, guidance, and uh, providing background documents for a harmonized European way to do uh, testing and monitoring. So there are already initiatives going in this direction. So um, these CSA uh, projects are limited in time and resources and other kind of things, but uh, probably many of us here doing this uh, wonderful research have to find ways to influence the actual consortium who will get the funding to implement some of our findings uh, in there. Yeah, so yeah, so we have to wait until the EC decided who will be granted. So we are part of, I think, two consortia in this case. But uh, yeah. Okay, maybe. Yes, please. Afterwards, I have another idea. <laughs> are there already any projects where you use like BIM methods or approaches like building information modeling where you can incorporate the information from the planning, the construction, and the use side just to visualize and um, visualize the state of the bridge or the building and probably use this as an augmentation basis for longer uses of um, structures? Um, here we talk about BIM. Is it a research topic or is it just a tool? Maybe uh, we have a practitioner here or about the role of BIM. Of course, we will have BIM. Everything will be BIM eyes. And I'm looking forward to it. It's obvious, but um, it's not, as far as I understand, it's not a tool that. Um, would help to uh, increase our scientific and technological knowledge about the structure like a wind turbine or bridge. Yeah. But anyhow, I think it's an important tool because if it's implemented in a proper way, you have all the knowledge at the same place or so single yeah. source of truth. So for the practitioners, it's very important. Unfortunately, so far in Germany, I think it's limited to the design and build phase. I don't know of many projects where it's really also used for the operational phase 
or even the de maintenance and demolishing phase. It's slowly going in this way. I know that the German railroads, they use BIM, at least they have some pilot projects to use uh, BIM also for existing structures and also to visualizing and um, all the data which are required over the lifetime, for example, NDT stuff. So they used it for uh, in, in some railway station renovation projects. But that's so far exceptional. So, but uh, I agree. So it's it's not a tool for research, it's a, but it's a tool for operating structures properly if used properly. And uh, what we have probably to provide are the tools to bring our results in there to allow them to be visualized and to inform the engineers tasked with the assessment uh, to use all the results there. So far, I've seen many projects where data were simply lost because the engineer with the tasked with the assessment didn't know that data were existing. So BIM can be helpful there, definitely. Any other view on uh, BIM? Just don't. Uh, maybe a little bit related, but related to wind turbines. What I think is just the same for other structures. So there is a number of projects where a so-called digital twin is being developed for wind turbines, where all the, both the design data, but also all the operational data, they are put together in a, in a database, which is then managed by a so-called digital twin, so that it's possible to make different investigations related both to lifetime extension, but also to how to operate uh, the turbines in a more optimal way. And that's a little bit similar, I think, to the application with in buildings and bridges, which is maybe not so far yet, but it's the same concept. And there is also a lot of research to be done, actually, how to handle all that uh, information in a usable way. OK, we have been discussing now for 45 minutes here, mostly front of the panel, but also uh, some likely uh, contribution from the audience here but no contribution from one of the ESRs. So I would like to ask <laughs> explicitly the ESRs here, you are the future. Um, do you have an urging uh, question or a comment on uh, what you have heard now during the 45 minutes of discussion? Do you have a different topic you want to have, uh, that you want to have discussed now for the remaining 15 minutes? Who among the uh, ESRs uh, wants to express him or herself? Bartek? So, from my point of view, it was really interesting to hear um, that we can still see two kind of approaches to the problem of the standardization of implementation of the techniques. So, from one side, we have our experts that are saying that we are trying to push it. Uh, from the bottom, but the guys on the top in the European Commission are not allowing us. Mm -hmm. And then we have the, the people from Brussels that are saying that we want to do it, but no one tells us what we should do. So I think that the biggest problem is really the communication between the, 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 the everyday users and the high level where they set the policies. <coughs> they cannot see each other, so they cannot work together and they cannot uh, move on with the implementation implementation of, the, of these methods and maybe this is the reason why as you said uh, already 20 years ago there have, there have been some techniques that even nowadays they are quite normal <laughs> and the question is how to really see each other discuss with each other and move on because i cannot see any conclusion <laughs> in this point okay any reaction or from the panel to this uh, rather provocative remark <laughs> <laughs> no? So it's uh, accepted. <laughs> we have to think about it a little bit. <laughs> okay, let's think about it. Oh, there is a red line. Yes, because uh, I was pleading and I'm pleading again for a higher role of these European trade federations. Please do and meet these people. And these people need to be more active and proactive. So this is the level which is missing of this uh, communication gap, the level of the European Trade Federation and Association. So those industries should speak to them, and then the Commission will speak to them, because they have an official role, a high role, 
the high devalued by the commission. Yes. And so they need to play that role, but you need to take the proactive step of going to meet these people. Is it up to us? Or? Yes. How many of these people are here now? I mean, this, this was publicly uh, announced that we have this final workshop. Mm -hmm. And there should be or could be people from, from the roads and railway domain for the bridges and from the wind turbine industry, of course, from these uh, federations <laughs> uh, sitting here. Is somebody here from one of these federations? Yeah. No. Why not? Well, because, because they are all sitting in, in Brussels. So. They, they receive a lot of invitation, so they will only go if they are specifically invited. So when you organize a meeting, you need to think about the people you want to have uh, attending your, mm -hmm. your final workshop. And then you, you need to tell the secretary of working group and so on. So I took the, the step of phoning or emailing these people and insisting for them to attend. So the same should apply here if you think you have an interesting uh, workshop. So it is up to the organizers to take the necessary step to ensure, not just hope, but ensure that some okay. uh, representatives will indeed attend. So this has to do with uh, communication outside yeah. the, the yeah. research program. Yeah. And we will do a swap analysis this afternoon about <laughs> InfraStar. <laughs> I know already what, what the opportunities or <laughs> what improvements uh, should be done. Yeah. Can, can I say? Just. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Because, for example, the person, the people, I didn't know, the, I don't know all the programs in the commission, but if I knew the CSA, mm -hmm. I would call the project officer of the CSA mm -hmm. to be here. Mm -hmm. Because actually in the CSA, <coughs> they need you as experts, etc. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what they, so the thing is that, again, I, I totally agree, knowing the, the correct person to contact and to, to, to who to, to forward the policy briefings, etc. So, Unfortunately, when we call about, we talk about EU and Commission, okay, these are very broad words yeah. which, if we don't put the face and the name, that don't really mean anything. But just, just also to answer to the provocative comment, exactly because I don't, don't, I don't agree, because it's not a matter of um, guess, it's not a matter of uh, people uh, of the Commission knowing what to do unless people tell them what to do. That is. How should they know that there should be a directive or uh, to do if nobody, this should come from the bottom actually. Yes, but I also must say everything is on the internet. If, if people are really interested in stuff, they, they go and search and, and Look, I and do that. Time. Mm -hmm. I always do that because- There are always good uh, examples. I, Thank I, you. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yes. not everybody does that. So, uh, but in this case, you need, you need to understand that there are very different structures that need to be motivated and, and okay. in order to, that is, it's the European Commission. Then it's also the, the European um, uh, Committee of the Social, uh, the, sorry, the European Social Committee, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the institution that has the groups of the society mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. Then it is the national governments again and the, the directs that they have. And then the engineers and, and the, tra the training and the industry. So you see all these people to communicate. It's not a simple thing. It's not a simple thing, but we have to find a solution. Yes, Let's keep to. that back. Totally agree. Okay, now I would like to have a second uh, ESR voice. Yes, Ligia. Maybe an ultimate solution that we open the door to send our engineers to those commission or authority or federal Do you have time to do that? <laughs> I mean, you want to, let's let be very pragmatic, down to earth. Your objective is to, to, to uh, get this doctoral title. And you do everything in order to get it as quickly as possible. And then also the amount of money is limited. I must say that as a supervisor. I do not want to send my doctor student to, to spend a week and trying to convince them. But you could for one week, you could go, not more. But, but then, it is in the, then it is in the program yes. and it is paid. Yes. Okay. Or then your next program, they say that uh, in the rice uh, staff exchanges, yeah. you can do that. Okay. So we develop uh, ways on how to improve these things, and I agree. 
but you have to be very down to earth. But I interrupted you, Richard, sorry. Uh, yeah, I feel like uh, to send an engineer or yeah. organization, so make our voice to be heard. And yes. And then we will know the problem and then we will open the door for further discussion. If we don't send people to them, we will never know. That's right. But I think in, in our program, we partly did that with the secondments. You were exposed to some, some industry contact and you came with, let's say, a high level uh, theoretical approach that you tried to explain to some practitioner. And I think uh, this is an interesting discussion. I think this was more or less uh, well done within the program. A next voice from the ESR, sorry. Yes, Antoine. Okay, so uh, for me, I'm, I'm really interested to know what about uh, mm -hmm. what about structure of monitoring. So, is there any incentives mm -hmm. from the European uh, uh, Commission or to to fund the real projects, really to apply these methods of real structures, or or I I, I, heard, I hear about countries. Uh, that are promising for fundings to uh, for um, for instrumentation of bridges or uh, reinforcement of bridges, but we don't hear I don't hear anything from the European. I think you should be more specific. Mm -hmm. You can monitor many things, Bridges. use um, uh, things that are not useful. Also, you have to to tell exactly precisely uh, what would you like to have. Uh, Monitor so, in, a, in a such a structural health monitoring program. What are the benefits? So, uh, the benefits for to, to know the state of roads and bridges, which is now uh, that's too large. <laughs> Not precise enough. <laughs> we know the state of, of bridges. Every bridge in Europe has, has, a, has, a, has, a, has a score on the condition based on. Inspections, yeah. visual inspections, Detail. mostly visual inspections. We say detail. still a powerful tool. As you say, detailed visual inspections, but uh, it's it's a powerful tool from which side to know the what what you see from the outside of, of the structure. But um, what's I only the, challenge you. <laughs> challenge you. <laughs> yeah, what we that. That are more precise. Well, what is really going inside the structure? So, uh, what I what, what I, I'm exactly not, inside the structure? Corrosion or no? I mean uh, on the structure side. So uh, the visual inspections now are based on um, okay. They say detailed inspections, but they search for what they see on the surface in terms of uh, maybe uh, um, deterioration of concrete, uh, corrosions. Uh, maybe uh, water, uh, water, water leakage, or but this is we not. Have to be short. Yeah, you know, this is not uh, on the structure side. We, you you cannot know the uh, the state of the structure based on these uh, elements. Okay, let's do more monitoring. I think mm -hmm. this is the key. Very short, more more Tesla also wanted to say uh, something. You are doing one one thing that we should uh, take care of that those people own the like infrastructure assets in the country. But most of the in most of the countries who owns is the government. We need to find a way to communicate to convince the government to, to But who is the government? Guys like you. Sooner or later you might work in such an authority. It's it's too general to say the government, an authority, an industry, whatever. It's you. What are you personally doing? You have the career in front of you. You have to do it better than my generation. Okay. <laughs> now we have a hand here. Yeah. <laughs> a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Again. You would like so to. My name is uh, Olivier Chassan. I'm a production official speaker in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, I was in a previous uh, professional life uh, working for the French Ministry of Transport mm -hmm. uh, in charge of uh, road and Bridges uh, yeah, projects. Uh, I'm a civil engineer uh, as a background. 
Uh, and I have a simple answer to your issue. I wanted to address this in my speech in a second, but uh, it's just now, so it's a uh, it's moment to, uh, to, to say what I want to say. Uh, the message to uh, government officials or to uh, owners of infrastructure for bridges or roads could be very simple. Mm -hmm. If you don't put in place a surveillance mechanism, you will go to jail. And this argument will be heard. Is heard. I've been confronted with the uh, problems uh, of uh, uh, damages on uh, bridges. And there is a moment where, or when, you have to take a decision to get the traffic. It's a very, very difficult decision. Okay? And nobody wants to take it. Hmm? But if you have uh, this uh, surveillance mechanism or this exploitation mechanism, there is a moment to say, uh, uh, as from today, hmm, I advise you to get the traffic, otherwise, hmm, you will be responsible for the loss of many lives hmm, in the recent history of human casualties. And you're welcome. Let's be careful. There are not so many structural engineers in prison right now. No, but this time will come, I'm sure. Uh, you, can, uh, you can give this argument. You can give this argument. And each time you will have uh, uh, an accident like the collapse of the bridge of Genoa, speak up and say this accident was preventable, was foreseeable, if we had put in place the right uh, instruments. Good point. Yes. And I think the journalists will uh, listen to you, and uh, this message will be heard by the victims, and we will see hmm, step by step uh, mindsets will change. Yes. I think we all agree on that, but we have to act uh, much earlier. This is the problem. We, we have to avoid failures, that's for sure. Of course, the, all failures can be avoided. So now I, I um, yeah, kind of uh, left the panelists uh, behind. Sorry for that. <laughs> Would you like to reflect on one of the statements that have been uh, done here? <clears throat> Because we are soon to stop, according to my to the plan. Mm -hmm. Yes, more. No, uh, there's been some provocative ones, and 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 you usually also lead with something like that. So now I'll try, even though it's normally not what I do. But um, you said you you uh, don't want to be in these Eurocode. Like John and I met through wind turbine standard development, and of course there's a lot of dead ends you go. Or go down, but it's also where you link the knowledge to the implementation. So if there's a lot of specialists like you who doesn't want to be part of it, I can see there's a link. Isn't that a, a good place to start? Because I think it's people like you. It's not the newly developed. It's the people who see a lot of research, see a lot of things. So if, if, if Many professors in bridges or it's experts in the industry do not want to be part of it. It's going to be somebody, maybe not with a finger on the pulse, that's who develops right. the standards. And maybe that's the problem, in particular in the, on, on the bridge uh, and building. Uh, so what maybe should make you go important. into that again? I need time and money. No, I'm, 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 I'm also too old for that because I will never apply these codes anymore. <laughs> so I'm not really motivated. But 20 years back, I... I but you, you sound motivated in changing them, so... I have lots of experience in, in Switzerland. And 20 years ago, I was uh, the main initiator of, of uh, uh, editing codes for existing structures. It's worldwide still uh, unique, this uh, set of uh, standards. So, so, okay. so my, my just listening to may, maybe missing com, uh, communication, you on Twitter, you might not, and I don't know, but uh, the, uh, maybe then you should try and get somebody else to go in that you know have abroad. Because it seems to be that if you go there, that for me is a very great link to the, 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 the closer to the law. 
because they are usually then adapted in the building laws that you agree. So usually I know the people that are working on these common things yeah. that can influence so them. I think that that's the, the link. Or convince them. Um, another comment, mm -hmm. still Tom? Yeah. Because then I would like to start to wrap up uh, things. Well, we all know that the uh, times are changing. Huh? We have this climate change, uh, this uh, call for sustainability. And uh, to some extent, that is, that is a new thing. Eh? I said already in the beginning, in, the, in uh, my experience of 20 years ago was when, no, 10 years ago, that when the bridge was uh, a little bit deteriorating, they easily said, let's build a new one. Uh, I think that's over now. Everybody realizes now that, uh, that we should use advanced methods to have, make better designs and, and better maintenance and, and better inspections. And I think that this, this should be a new incentive to also increase the amount of uh, uh, communication between the various parties involved, uh, the, the research people, the practicing engineers, and the responsible authorities. Uh, so I think we should use that. Uh, we, we know our part, uh, what we can do, and we should make this clear to the other parts in uh, the other partners in the world. Is there still an urgent? Uh, yes, you have a point. To, yes, I just want to make a point that maybe because your application goes, it's not only about Europe standards uh, directly, it's also what national countries do. And I feel, <clears throat> I, I see a field of uh, implementation of your research in the cohesion funds that go to countries, not to all countries. Okay. But that is, this is the structural funds that in, our, in each country that can be used for uh, also implementing uh, this kind of monitoring, for example, at the national level. I don't know if you have, if you have done that, but because I see this for Greece, for example, it would for sure be it, it could for sure be a part of uh, of the next uh, framework program of what they should implement for, uh, for our uh, infrastructure. I think this is certainly or could be certainly very nice and, and uh, mm -hmm. beneficial uh, initiative. That's right. But may I be uh, may I be a little bit provocative as a Swiss? Do we always need money from Brussels? Shouldn't it be uh, I mean uh, a motivation by the industry because they see the potential and the benefit of a new technology that they do it by their own? Yes, but I they can make money out of it. Yes, yes, you're right. They don't need Brussels. Yes, okay. I completely agree, but uh, that at the state level to start monitoring of what happens. I'm not sure if in Greece we have this. This is what I'm saying, but it's also like neg uh, negligence of the domain. Okay. Okay, <laughs> I would like to conclude this uh, panel discussion with one question to the panelists. <laughs> Now this evening, uh, and uh, from tomorrow on, uh, infrastructure is practically over. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have an answer of everybody of you. Uh, so next week, really practically next week, when infrastructure is behind us, this panel discussion about lowering environment, environmental impact uh, of bridges and wind turbines uh, is over. Next week, what are you going to do in order to lower the environmental impact? Either on a bridge or on a wind turbine, you all are working in, in, in this domain. Really, I would like to have a precise answer. It can be a serious one. And also, let's say, more personal, not so uh, yeah, funny answer also. Just a thing, about very short. Yeah, uh, so simple answer would be I came here by train, so <laughs> didn't use a plane. So, so uh, more elaborated answer. So luckily to implement uh, the, the one of the monitoring tools which was uh, further developed in this project, we are uh, next week we have to submit the proposal and the budget uh, to implement this monitoring to a bridge in southern Germany where ultrasonic monitoring, but also acoustic emission and other things were done to keep a bridge in place for a longer time. Very good. Because Did you estimate how much uh, resources you, you can save? Uh, so I think it's a, it's a seven digit number. Yeah. A seven digit number. Seven digit number. Yeah, so the, the new bridge would yeah. cost more, oh, than, uh, definitely more than a million euro. So because the, the bridge is thought to be structurally deficient. So according to the previous codes, it shouldn't stand anymore, but okay. it's standing. Morton, next week. 
You yes, are. big big question. What what can I do next week? <laughs> Is that my vacation week? Yeah. Um, no. The I, I yeah. Uh, I, fortunately, in the, in the wind industry, all the optimizations are, are lowering the environmental impact uh, of oh, energy. Of course, yeah. So that is. <laughs> Good start, uh, but but I'm especially working with the with the concrete uh, designs. So so there we are continuously uh, updating our our guidelines uh, that we issue, and there are both uh, the, the the fatigue uh, the formula, uh, formulas, the safety factors included, are discussed, and also health monitoring uh, whether we can we can add okay, something. How much carbon dioxide will be saved from from my effort next week? How many <laughs> I have no no idea. Okay, you better calculate. <laughs> it's all about communication. We, we just realized that in our uh, job. Yeah. So I'll be working in two uh, two different domains. So bridges and wind turbines. So within wind turbines, uh, we are just now starting up a new project on probabilistic design, how to uh, develop it further, but also how to implement it in standards. And that uh, we have promised in the application that we can lower the cost of energy between two and five percent by yeah, using that. Nice. So that's uh, at least an deal. estimate, which is coming from industry. So it's not just something we have we have uh, set at the university. Okay. Nice. And then in addition, I'm also I'm not so pessimistic with the standards and the euro codes as you are, because I'm quite a lot involved in that. So also on the bridge side, we are working on how to use, in fact, some of the uh, results from this project here in existing bridges, how to extend the lifetime, including the use of the so-called value of information approach. So that's also something supported by the Danish uh, Road Directorate, which is very interested in these aspects. Mark, your contribution to Yes, yes, I will give you not a number which we can <laughs> say, <laughs> but we have two uh, yeah, starting or ongoing research projects on the fatigue uh, mechanisms in concrete and to find um, yeah more reliable indicators to give a project like this um, yeah the tools uh, for developing methods or um, yeah structural health monitorings to yeah detect. Uh, structures during their lifetime with reliable uh, results or measurements. And Tom? Yeah, well, what in the, in the first place uh, I have to do is uh, to contact to contact our uh, TNO, TNO uh, the, the organization where I work, uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, to contact the, uh, the owner of the bridges, who, in principle, uh, tell us more or less uh, what to do in the end. Huh? We can make proposals, but in the end they have to say yes or no, we pay you the money. And uh, I think for sure some of the things I've seen in, in all these projects uh, uh, I can take uh, on board when I'm going to discuss with them the condition with, uh, with respect to a number of, of bridges, which Mostly is... Uh, then that uh, these measures will reduce the environmental impact. That is of course a point, but uh, I think your structural safety is to be uh, active in the field of, of sustainability and to try to, to get their uh, better results uh, until now. You will hear from that uh, within short time, I'm sure. Okay, thank you very much. I think this concludes this uh, panel discussion. I will give my real point on what I will do next week uh, during the coffee break. <laughs> so let's give a hand to the panelists and also to the audience.